Thank you very much, Corey. I will try to live up to that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, all right, so financial disclosures. So small cell lung cancer is a highly aggressive malignancy. It accounts for about 15% of all lung cancers, and the majority of patients with small cell present with extensive stage disease. Uh, and this is a major problem because the prognosis for such patients is very poor. Non-small cell lung cancer, as we've been hearing over the last day and a half, has experienced revolutionary breakthroughs. There's been all of these targeted therapies, immunotherapies we'll hear about later today, but the last drug that was approved for small cell was in 2007. Um, the prognosis, which you can see in this table at the bottom, is quite limited even for those patients with limited stage disease. This is a disease where there is a lot of room for improvement. So the current state, the first line standard of care is a platinum and etoposide. And we've learned through multiple trials that adding a third agent doesn't really seem to improve the outcomes. It does increase the toxicity. So we know that adding a hedgehog inhibitor does not help. Adding an IGF-1R inhibitor does not help. Um, adding maintenance chemotherapy does not help. Uh, the addition of prophylactic cranial irradiation or consolidative chest radiation and extensive stage disease can be considered. Um, but at this point, the only approved second-line agent is topotecan. A recent study looked at amrubicin versus topotecan and showed no improvement with that agent. So there's a lot of places where we can get better with this drug, with this uh, disease. So what I want to discuss today is first some novel cytotoxic agents and how we can better administer these cytotoxic agents. Then I want to discuss immune checkpoint inhibitors, and then I want to talk a little bit about some emerging approaches that sort of go outside of those areas. So why is small cell lung cancer so hard to target? We have been looking, as Evan and Ronnie were saying before, and as um, Tracy was saying yesterday, we look at these genomes of, our, of these tumors, and we're able to find a targetable mutation. So it's not that there are not targets in small cell. In fact, it's a heavily mutated tumor. The problem is that the things that are mutated most commonly in small cell are P53 and RB. And these are two tumor suppressor genes. And while we can give a drug to turn off an on switch, so you have a light that's plugged in and the switch to turn it off isn't working, you can still unplug the lamp. But if you have something wrong in your electrical system in your house where all of your lights are turning on, it's a lot harder to deal with that problem. So turning off an off switch is a major problem. PARP inhibitors um, are an intriguing option in this disease. They've been yielded promising results in BRCA-driven tumors, and PARP is part of what the body uses to repair DNA damage. So BRCA tumors are associated with a defect in the ability to repair DNA damage, so there's what's called therapeutic efficacy, it's therapeutic cytotoxicity. It's going to get only at the place where these mutations are present. PARP inhibitors have also shown efficacy in prostate and pancreas cancers um, where BRCA2 mutations are a known etiologic factor. Um, and we know that DNA repair is a problem in these diseases in general. But remember, I was saying that mutated, there are lots of mutations in small cell. Um, and could, is it possible that by incorporating PARP inhibition that we could improve the outcomes for patients with this deadly disease? So this led to the development of ECOG 2511, which was a phase 1-2 study which evaluated the combination of cisplatin and etoposide with or without viliparib, which is a PARP inhibitor. Now, the phase one has been reported with nine patients enrolled, um, and this was in the first line setting. Uh, the phase two has completed accrual, but it has not yet been reported. 
So I'll show you a little bit about what we saw. Um, the recommended phase two dose was established at 100 milligrams twice daily of viliparib, um, but there was an increased rate of cytopenias with this combination. Um, most of the patients had died at the time of this publication, and these are the responses that they saw. And you can see a complete response of 14.3% and a partial response 57.1%. And these numbers are very exciting, except that if you compare them to the expected response rates that we would see with just cisplatin dendotoposide, they're not that much better. We're not really seeing a home run here. So I look forward to seeing the phase two randomized data, but I'm concerned that we're not gonna see fireworks. So, there actually are some drugs, though, in small cell that are having very exciting efficacy. So remember, we're looking in these next generation sequencing platforms. We're looking at the genes. We're looking at the DNA. But what if that's not the right place to look for small cell? So delta-like Three, delta like ligand 3, DLL3, is a key ligand in what's called the notch pathway. And it turns out that, as you can see over here, the, um, it's upregulated in both small cell patients, in small cell patient derived xenografts, and it's upregulated in large cell neuroendocrine tumors but it essentially is absent in normal tissues. This is a cell surface receptor, which is present on these tumors. So it's a really nice target to consider as a therapeutic option. So this led to the development of this drug. I think I have the privilege of having the most complicated name of drug to say. Um, so rovalpatuzumab tesserine is an antibody drug conjugate. Now, um, this has been uh, established before with um, drugs like adotrastuzumab emtansine in breast cancer. Um, and what you have is you have an antibody which targets a specific uh, target on the cell surface, and then it's bound to what they call a warhead. Seems like an unnecessarily violent term, but in any case, uh, it's bound to this PBD warhead, which is a novel DNA crosslinker. And the common thread with all of these antibody drug conjugates is that you're able to administer a drug that if you were to just administer it directly intravenously, you would have completely unacceptable toxicity. But because it only releases when the antibody binds to its target, we're able to get nice efficacy with minimal toxicity. So this is a phase one study of rovalpatuzumab tesserine, which was presented this past year by Charlie Rudin at ASCO. Um, 82 patients with neuroendocrine tumors, the majority of whom had small cell, were enrolled. And you can see it was a wide variety of pretty heavily pretreated patients. But I think the most important thing to get from this is that 67% of patients were what is phrased DLL3 high. So it's all well and good to have a target that we know exists on our tumors, but if it's not present or it's present in 2%, it's hard to get as excited. But up to almost 70% of the patients who were screened for this study had this marker, so thus were going to be eligible for subsequent studies. And if you take an even lower estimate at 1%, it was 88% of these patients. So here's the adverse events. You can see that the rate of grad, grade three adverse events was relatively tolerable. The most common things were fatigue and cytopenias, but there are episodes of serosal effusions and edema, which can develop with this agent, which is relatively unique to this agent. Um, and here's the waterfall plot. So you can see um, that there was a very nice response rate. The green, the light green indicates those patients who have a DLL3 high staining. And you can see that there's a, a majority of those patients below the line, indicative that this biomarker is a useful one towards the use of this drug. Um, and what you can see here in comparison to standard chemotherapy, we can see that there's efficacy both in platinum sensitive as well as in platinum refractory disease. There's efficacy in second line as well as in third line. 
see a median overall survival of 5.8 months, which is appealing for this heavily pretreated patient population. How about immune checkpoint inhibitors? So I mentioned before there are a lot of mutations in small cells. So that might make a high mutational burden and thus an ideal disease with which to do immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and so this led to the development of Checkmate 32, which was a multi-cohort phase 1-2 evaluating nivolumab monotherapy or nivolumab with various doses of ipilimumab. And here I've broken down the various uh, patient populations, but you can see that all patients um, got nivolumab alone after four cycles of ipilimumab, which is what is done in melanoma, but is not necessarily what's done in some of the non-small cell studies. So this is the patient population. You know, you, it's hard to see this, but you can see that it's a classic small cell patient population. But what I call your attention to is this. This is the PDL1 expression level. So if you look at the greater than 1%, well, that doesn't sound, uh, doesn't sound like it's very prevalent. The greater than 1% PDL1 staining is only 14%, 24%. These are this is not a terribly PDL1 hot disease. So it's unclear whether this would be a terribly useful biomarker for the uh, choice of PD1 therapy in small cell. Here we see the results. We see that an overall response rate ranged from 10 to 23%, depending upon the combination, but there was no difference in the overall survival seen between the various arms. Uh, but then the question is, is adding the ipilimumab really worth it here? Um, ipilimumab was not surprisingly associated with added toxicity. 13% uh, rate of grade three to four adverse events with nivolumab, up to 30% or 19% depending upon the ipi dose. The overall response rate was higher with the combination, but there was no apparent overall survival benefit. There are ongoing studies trying to more definitively answer the question of combo versus monotherapy, including Checkmate 451. But there's actually been a recent study that looks at the activity of ipilimumab in small cell lung cancer. This was recently published in JCO, um, where they took patients and in the first line randomized them to platinum etoposide with or without ipilimumab. And the ipilimumab was added after a couple of doses of platinum to maybe get neoantigens floating around. Um, now, excitingly, there was no increase in the total adverse events when you added ipilimumab as compared to placebo. But there was a higher percentage of patients who discontinued their therapy due to the adverse events on the ipilimumab arm. And here's the overall survival. These are pretty much on top of each other. Um, so it's difficult to look at this data and think that there's a lot of activity here for this drug. Um, so in summary of checkpoint inhibitors, there's apparent efficacy to PD-1 blockade. It's similar efficacy to what we see in second and third line uh, um, cytotoxics, certainly. Um, evaluation of pseudoprogression is really complicated in small cell because these are not diseases that like to sit around. You can't just wait another four weeks. Often your patients are not alive at that point if they're progressing. I think nivolumab is a reasonable option in platinum refractory disease, and it has gained compendium listing with or without ipilimumab, um, but I I'm hesitant to use CTLA-4 blockade at this time in the absence of further data. So a couple of points on emerging approaches. Um, there was a phase one study of Seneca Valley virus, which was thought to be, uh, you know, uh, had neuroendocrine tropism. It was going to be exciting. But a phase two study uh, through ECOG was stopped for futility. So this is likely not going to be the answer. At ESMO this year, there was a phase two study, which was presented of alicertib, which is an aurora kinase A inhibitor, um, in combination with paclitaxel or paclitaxel with placebo. So if you look at the overall results, uh, the progression-free survival was greater, um, or trend towards greater at the very least, with alicertib of 101 days versus 66 days. Again, not a slam dunk here. But if you break it down by MIC status, those patients who were C-MIC positive by immunohistochemistry, which on this study, and it was a subgroup that they checked, 
uh, was 71.7% of the patients had a marked improvement with progression-free survival with the addition of alicertib. Um, at the same ESMO presentation, um, the Foundation Medicine Group uh, presented their results for next-gen sequencing of small cell and found that MYC amplification and fusions uh, were also found in small cell. And one particular patient had a MYC fusion, happened to get alicertib, and had a near complete response to that therapy. So MYC may be an important biomarker for the use of alicertib moving forward. And finally, I want to touch a little bit about circulating tumor cells. You know, we, speak, uh, we spoke yesterday about liquid biopsies, and I think that they're an important component of cancer care moving forward. But uh, small cell is unique in that circulating tumor cells can really be detected quite frequently. Um, and this was from a, a cohort of patients where they looked at the prognostic impact of those circulating tumor cells. In the top curve, what you see is that those patients who have greater than 50 circulating tumor cells per the unit of measurement had a much worse overall survival. Perhaps even more interesting, if you look through therapy, the bottom curve, you have three curves there. The top curve is those patients who have a low amount of circulating tumor cells at diagnosis and continue to have a low amount after treatment they do pretty darn well. You look at the middle group, those are patients who have a high amount of circulating tumor cells and then go down low after treatment. They do okay. But the last group, those patients who have persistently elevated circulating tumor cells even after therapy, really do very, very poorly. And this particular change in circulating tumor cells was the most important predictor of overall survival and progression-free survival and was beyond stage, PS, number of metastases. So this may really be an important next step if we can somehow target this and turn this around. So in conclusion, Small cell lung cancer remains a difficult disease to treat, but we're actually seeing some advances in this cancer. Um, randomized confirmatory studies are underway, but we've got a long way to go. I thank you very much.